Check, 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 check. Howdy, everybody. Well, thank, uh, thank you for taking the time to join us at lunch. Um, I won't take too much time. I'm actually going to do an introduction of, uh, of a colleague and friend who will do the actual introduction of our speaker, if that's okay. And so first, um, the purpose of this seminar series is really to focus on global health, global health security. And um, one, I hope that I can uh, elicit and maybe encourage and promote a passion um, in all of our students, uh, particularly our students and faculty are, are interested in, in global health and global health security uh, specifically. There are a lot of huge challenges in global health and global health security, and we're going to need new thinking and creative ideas and wisdom to kind of uh, tackle some of these challenges. And we're going to we're going to hear about one of those those huge challenges today with our our renowned uh, speaker. So without further ado, I'd first like to introduce Dr. Gary Adams, who's a um, a very good dear friend, colleague, and actually he was a mentor of mine as when I was a student. Uh, just a couple years ago. So, Dr. Adams. Well, thank all of you for coming today. This, uh, you are the next generation for people who's gonna work in Global One Health. I can't tell you how much fun that is. I've spent about 10 years of my career in South America, Africa, in Germany with Professor Kaufman, and in Canada and other places. And what I find is every place you go in the world, you will find interested individuals in doing something beyond direct hard science, going for the big buck, or going for power. They want to give something back. So today, our speaker, Professor Kaufman, you'll have an example where we go from the microbe interaction with the host at the molecular level, all the way through to application of a vaccine developed for people, worldwide application, now particularly in India and in South Africa. I was fortunate to have done a sabbatical in his laboratory, and I learned a lot in that laboratory. And what I saw, what I saw was creativity implemented. His ability to think through how a bacterial organism, such as Listeria or Mycobacteria or Salmonella, how it interacts with the host and how that is the basis for developing a vaccine. So going from molecular to application is what you'll see from Professor Kaufman today. He is, I think, the world's number one expert on tuberculosis, without a doubt. He spent many, many years understanding this relationship and how that re relationship can be applied to a vaccine. Published over 900 papers, he's received, I won't even begin to think through the awards, all the awards that you can think of, as important as those are. What's more important is his contribution to developing a vaccine for protecting people against tuberculosis. Number one killer in the world, you'll see the details on that. What he's done in, for humans, we're hoping to use his technology and approach for animals, for tuberculosis in cattle and in wildlife, in particular deer in the USA. So it's my pleasure, great pleasure, to introduce Professor Stefan Kaufman. None like him, and I was so fortunate to have time to spend with Professor Kaufman. Would you help me and, and help me and uh, to welcome Professor Kaufman? Excellent, glad to have you here. And thank you for having me here too. Um, so this is a more a seminar style and I hope I get somehow something for you. Um, voice okay, everything okay, good. Let's start. Let's start, but I have an issue here, so it's no longer coming. Should we, should I go up here again? Yeah, 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 yeah. It fell asleep and these are sometimes these issues. You know, in, at about five years ago, a very famous and very high reputation journal named Nature published a small report on the major infectious disease killers in the world. And what came up immediately was there is one number one infectious disease killer and that's tuberculosis or better say 
the pathogen mycobacterium tuberculosis. More than all the others, they analyze smallpox, malaria, plague, influenza, cholera, AIDS together. So this is a big issue over the last 200 years. And you may argue now, this is all a matter of the past. And in part, you are right, because at the turn of the century to the 19th to the 20th century, indeed, the real killer was TB. I found some evidence for that here in this paper, which was published in 1951. And what you see here, about 14 people of all people who died, they died of tuberculosis. And that was in New York City, but it was also in the place where I normally work when I'm not here in Texas, and that is Berlin, where there were about 12%. And amongst the working people, that is in the New York State, they, or New York City, they looked at males only. In Prussia at that time, Berlin, it was about 40%. So almost half of everybody who died, died of tuberculosis. But you could argue again, that's the past. Actually, it was so important that at that time, another Bill Gates-like person called Patton, and I found this advertisement recently in the uh, New York Times of 1911, created a big fund to sponsor and support intervention measures. But unfortunately, this was insufficient because even today, TB is the number one killer among of all infectious agents. Every day, 120,000 people get infected, and that's up to about 1.7 people who are infected with the agent mycobacterium tuberculosis. 1.7 billion, about a quarter of all people on this globe. Now, the good news is that not all of those get infected, get disease. Only a minority will develop disease, and that is about 10 million people in the last year, leading to about 1.5 million people who died of tuberculosis. And as I said now several times, this renders M tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, still the number one killer um, of the world. I don't know whether you have thought about it in this way, and I don't ask around because most people would say, no, I really didn't. Um, uh, think of this, we think of uh, influenza, we think of HIV and so on, but over the last 200 years, and even today, this is the case. So it's the biggest killer of all infectious agents, and unfortunately, I have to tell you, it's getting worse. First, there is this co-infection with HIV, AIDS, and indeed in Africa, HIV has been the driving force for tuberculosis. As I told you before, people get infected, not all get disease, but of course, this is because their immune response controls the bacteria in the host, and once the immune response is deficient, AIDS, acquired immune deficiency, then TB breaks out, and that makes about one million people much higher by proportion that die or get disease, TB disease, because they are HIV co-infected, and that's another 400 or so people who die of TB, included in the 1.5 million. So HIV AIDS has been called the perfect storm, and I agree with this totally. Tuberculosis is the number one cause of death among HIV infected individuals, and HIV AIDS is being, has been the driving force for the re-emergence of tuberculosis over the last 20 to 30 years, and this is not the end. Another issue is the increasing incidences of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. This is a major issue nowadays. You have heard about antimicrobial resistance. We normally think of hospitals, but to make it short, I'll come back to that in a second. The number one AMR, antimicrobial resistance bug, the number one amongst all bad bugs, again, is mycobacterium tuberculosis, not in the US, not in Germany or Europe, but in the world. So we have to estimate that about 50 million people are already infected with MDR-TB. I call this a kind of a time bomb. It's not that all of them get disease. As I said before, it's again 5 to 10 percent. But still, it is about half a million, half a million of the people um, who will suffer from disease. They suffer from MDR, multi-drug resistant TB, leading to another 100 90 or 200,000 deaths. 
I show you a few pictures of people and I can guarantee that they all gave consent, that it's a very important point for me, that they gave consent to show these pictures. Now, this is a person I met in uh, South Africa. He was a gold miner, he was a coal miner near um, the um, capital and near Johannesburg, but he came from the countryside. So what happened was that in the mines, of course, they get a lot of dust, which affects the lung. So this man developed TB, and unfortunately it was MDR TB. And then he was far away from home, and he got HIV from professional sex workers. So this man has to swallow every day numbers, a dozen or so drugs for MDR TB and HIV. He looks quite happy, I would say, so I really um, adore this person. But let me just summarize what that means, MDR-TB for you. This is an advertisement that appeared a couple of years ago in, uh, by uh, Medicines Sans Frontieres or Doctors Without Borders. And what it illustrates very, very impressively is if you have MDR-TB over the two years of treatment, you have to swallow some 15 thousand pills with, in South Africa at least, with the chance of getting cured 50%. So only every second person gets cured. Isn't that a real traumatic situation? So as I said before, MDR-TB is the deadliest of all bad bugs. It's not the hospitalism nosocomial infection. It is globally speaking different here, obviously. It is TB. And yet it's still getting worse because now we even have XDRTB, extensively drug resistant TB, where almost no drugs can do any cure. So, for, there are certain drug treatment regimens, they work sometimes, but in the most cases, the fail. So, this is something really deadly. I don't know whether you know Jim Nachtwey. Jim Nachtwey is a US citizen, one of the most famous war photographers in the world. And one day he decided not only go into human to human war, but also go into the war of humans to, uh, with microorganisms. And he decided to go for the deadliest ones, to go for MTB. And I had, the, um, I had actually the honor and pleasure to invite him to Berlin, where he showed his very, very impressive photographs. Very impressive, I think. And, um, I think that a picture tells more than a thousand words, but if you see the people, then the visual is even stronger. And I have been in South Africa at these places near Durban or north of Durban, actually, and I can tell you it really can break your heart. So finally, actually, late, but finally, the world took, more, took this all more serious. And in 2018, one of the very few high-level meetings took place, and this meeting was dedicated to the major killer, tuberculosis. This high-level meeting was signed by all participants, so it is something that 196 nations agreed, and we know that, unfortunately, some of these signatures are not that valuable as you would like them to be, but still there is hope that this has been
taking more serious on the political, on the global political level. And one of the statements is here, and I just wanted to point out the major facts. That is that the United Nations global um, uh, agreement is that we want to defeat to control TB by 2030. That's a very ambitious goal. I will come back later to that. Because TB, as I told you before, is the leading cause of death. It is the most common form of antimicrobial resistance and it is the leading cause of death of people with uh, HIV. So, how can we solve this issue? Well, this is a very complicated issue and I will focus today on better medical intervention measures which are urgently needed and that's agreed by all. So why do we need new therapeutics, new drugs, new diagnostics and new vaccines? We have them, but they were invented 100 years ago, 50 years ago, and now these weapons are no longer as strong as they had been. But we still agree all that we need those and we need new ones. And is this sufficient? That's a question we, I can't answer, but in my, and I'm a researcher primarily, in my opinion, we need even other tools, namely biosignatures, host, which measures host responses, and I will come back to you, to better diagnose and prognose disease. And we need host-directed therapy, a new approach to treatment where we can learn, for example, from cancer drugs, and we can discuss that later if you're interested. But the most important point clearly is we need to have those in an interactive way. These have to be seen as a whole and not separately. So let me focus on two examples which I've been involved lot and that's TB biomarkers to not only diagnose TB but also to prognose TB to tell who will develop disease over the next years because I consider this very important and then I will tell you a little bit about the vaccine we will have developed and we hope that will enter clinical application in the next couple of years which means very soon. Let's start with host biomarkers. So the very simple principle which we once proposed, and that's about 10 years ago, was let's see how the host responds in those who are infected by healthy, the 1.7 billion people in the world, differs from those who got disease very recently. And that was supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It was a very complex issue, but it works. So what we wanted to see is, can we find di differential diagnostic markers? As I said before, can we find prognostic markers? And if you take all the data together, which we had accumulated and others, and which were in the public domain, and also our own data altogether, what I can show you here is that by a rock curve, which defines sensitivity of a measurement and specificity of a measurement, you get about 90% sensitivity and specificity, which is actually very good. And you only need two, uh, three to four markers, which tells you that with three to four transcript markers, that is blood gene expression markers, gene expression markers in the blood of, in this case, individuals who had disease or were healthy, you can di diagnose by 90% sensitivity and specificity. I'm not going into these rock curves, but believe me, they are the best way to show sensitivity and specificity. You can have high specificity, but you also need high sensitivity. You can have high sensitivity, but obviously you all so need high specificity. So that worked. So what about prognosis? Now, this was the real challenge for us, which started in 2006, 7 about, and then took quite a long time. What we did, uh, we went into several sites in Sub-Saharan Africa and found, or the doctors, the clinicians there, identified, diagnosed people with active TB. So that's the index case, the person who just developed disease. That's the important part of the story, but the more important part are the household contacts, that is the people who are in close contact. And we asked those people whether we, they would allow us to take blood from them at 6, 18, or 24 months. And then we looked at the transcripts at the blood cells, what the gene expression does. And here we wanted to see whether we can already get indication 18 months before whether they will develop disease or not. 
So at the end of the story, at the end of the trial, 97.8%, 98% almost were protected over the two years that did not develop disease, and 2 to 3% got disease, and we compare these two groups. And what comes up again on a rock curve is, is shown here. This is clearly not as good as the diagnosis. In this particular case, for example, what we get is about 80% sensitivity and about 50% specificity. You can move along that. So this is a proof of concept study. It shows it works in principle, and that's promise, and it works at different sites on the sub-Saharan continent but we need to improve it and that's the fine work now. So we consider that as a proof of concept study that we can do it, it can be done. And again, we only need very, very few markers. We, ap we approach this with a very specific bioinformatics system where we look at all upregulated genes and all downregulated genes. The computer forms pairs of the upregulated over the downregulated genes and comes up with about few pairs that are sufficient. Pair one here is complement component over a T cell receptor. The other one is anchoring repeat domain over, over oxysterol binding protein. So these two pairs were sufficient to get data which I showed to you that is about 60-70% sensitivity, 50-60% specificity or vice versa. So that's not bad. And what is it good for? Well, this allows you for the first time now to identify individuals who likely will develop disease with a high um, a sensitivity specificity. And now you can offer these people preventive treatment. If you talk about treatment on infectious diseases, we normally consider this for therapy of someone who is diseased. Here, you want to offer treatment before disease occurs and equally important for the population before disease can be spread. Because those who are healthy but infected will not develop, will not spread the pathogen, not spread disease. And that's currently done by our colleagues in South Africa in a clinical trial, again supported by the Gates Foundation, to find out whether in this way, on a whole population level, on a whole population level, incidences can be reduced by preventive therapy. So this was the one part which I want to discuss in a little bit more detail. The other part is vaccines. I'm not familiar, I don't know whether you are familiar with BCG, which is a vaccine that we have, Basil calmet guerin developed in the 1990s, uh, 1910 to 20, which is given in many parts of the world. It's never been uh, introduced into the US. Now BCG has been praised and has been condemned. The truth is in between. BCG does what it should do because the inventors originally wanted it as a vaccine for newborn. So what it does, it prevents TB in many cases of babies as extra pulmonary TB. It does, however, not prevent pulmonary TB. And now pulmonary TB, as we know, is the major issue. First, that's the major form of the disease in adults and adolescents, and obviously pulmonary TB is the disease that spreads the disease to others because everybody has to, to breath and has to cough if one has TB. So what we uh, wanted to see is, is there something which can improve? Of course, the question can be asked, why don't we have a better vaccine? We have so many wonderful vaccines against against measles, mumps, rubella, against diphtheria, and many others, why don't we have one a vaccine that's better than BCG? If you, very, if you simplify it as much as possible, this comes down that most vaccines, that are, if not all vaccines that we have, work through antibodies. It is the pre-existing antibodies in your blood that have been induced, they see the pathogen and they block, let's say, attack of the pathogen of the cell, they see a toxin, block the toxicity of the toxin. So antibodies are the crucial element of our current vaccines. What we need for TB, however, is T lymphocytes because the pathogen hides in macrophages. And macrophages should kill it, but they don't, or at least they don't do it as good as they should do it. And that means antibodies don't see the bacteria because they are in these phagocytic cells. So mycobacterium tuberculosis is an intracellular pathogen that hides in host cells and therefore antibodies are not 
the first choice. I'm not, I'm not saying antibodies are not helpful at all, but they are of minor uh, importance in the defense against TB. So what we need is a T cell mediated immune response. And in other words, we need, we need vaccines that stimulate T cells. And without going into the whole immunology of, uh, of TB, let me just state that's more complicated. So where are we now in the TB vaccine pipeline? Before I come to that, one more issue to go introduce you into clinical trials. I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, clinical trials. So let me summarize. Normally, if you have a, a medicine, be it a drug or a vaccine, this goes through three major steps. The first step is phase one trial, that is safety and immunogenicity in humans. And that is being done typically in the country where the medicine had been developed, be it the US or Europe. Europe forms a kind of unity here. So in our case, Germany is this uh, European um, vaccine candidate. Once you have gone through the first step, phase one, and know that the vaccine or the medicine is safe, you go into the next step, that phase two. And in phase two, you can separate phase two A and B. Phase 2A is the target population. If you have a medicine or a vaccine, like in our case, partly, like our new vaccine, and you want to give that later, hopefully if it works, into neonates, here now you look for the target population, whether it's safe and immunogenic in the target population, in our case, neonates. Phase 2B is not compulsory. You do it to get the first evidence, if you do it, you do it as a first evidence whether your vaccine shows efficacy. The data are often not sufficient to go further without the next step, but you get some impression. So if you don't want to lose all the money in a big study, you may want to do a phase 2B. Actually, I have to say in our case, those who pay the bill ultimately, I'll come back to that, they decided not to go into phase 2B, go directly into phase 3, which means if you fail, you have lost a lot of money. If you win, you have saved some money. And that's how it works now. And then, of course, there are phase four, which after licensing. But these are the steps you have to do before you can go for licensing of any medicine. Now, this we don't need to go into details. What it shows you is that at the different stages, phase one, 2A, 2B, 3, different component, different vaccine candidates are currently being tested. And I want to draw your attention to VPM, which appears here, here, and here in phase three, because that's our own vaccine. And I claim some bias and conflict of interest here, because that's our vaccine which we develop. But here on this official um, um, slide here, you see it is a very highly advanced vaccine. And I will talk very briefly a little bit about it without any details. The second thing you will have to learn before I come to our vaccine is that in TB, there are very, very different targets. So here you have a very complex situation. If you think about a neonate, what you want is to give it immediately after birth. And yes, BCG indeed is given within days after birth, which is sometimes for some people very hard to believe, but that's how it is. So if you give it to a baby that has not been contact around, you give it pre-exposure with infection because the baby is still naive and you give it to prevent infection or disease. If you go for adolescents and adults, some of them are already infected. Remember the 1.7 billion people who are infected. Here you consider two populations, adults who are already infected and then you give the vaccine post-exposure, which means after they got infected or pre-exposure if they are still naive. Then there are some candidates for therapeutic vaccination because of MDR, XDR, multi-resistant strains. You would at least like to see a vaccine effect here. That's mostly as in adjunct to chemotherapy. Nobody currently thinks of a vaccine that works 100% in the therapeutic vaccination schedule. You want to give it in adjunct. If you have an XCRTB patient, an MDRTB patient, to reduce the number of drugs that are needed and to reduce the time of treatment. And finally, there is a very interesting approach, which is also um, uh, being considered mostly for clinical trials. That's prevention of recurrence, where people had tuberculosis, they were cured, but they get disease again. 
So it's like in cancer relapse, and it is here recurrence, that is, it occurs again. And here you want to treat people, uh, vaccinate people after the cure of disease to prevent recurrence. Now that were the kind of general ideas which I wanted to um, share with you. And now we come to our own vaccine, which has now been termed VPM1002. It is a live vaccine. It's no longer very usual to develop live vaccines. We were convinced that you need a live vaccine. And again, we can discuss that in more detail. It is based on BCG because I, our opinion was, let's be optimistic, BCG does something. Instead to identify a new wheel or to reinvent the wheel, we thought we take BCG, make it better and hope it works better. And we use it as a pre-exposure BCG in neonates, a pre and post-exposure in adults, and the post-exposure for recurrence, prevention of recurrence, you know, those who had disease and then um, um, uh, were cured and come back with the disease. This is the cellular mechanisms of our vaccine, and I will not go into details because it takes another half an hour or so to go through it, just to tell you it's a very complex intracellular cell biology issue. Just take it that it's uh, we, we, we more stepwise found out that this is much more complex than we thought originally. If you have questions, let me know what goes intracellular. What we know is clearly that through all the mechanisms that are activated, we get a little bit more inflammation through cytokines of the IL-1B, the IL-18 type. We get um, apoptosis, which means cell death, and therefore increase the kind of stimulatory activity for T lymphocytes. And we get autophagy and xenophagy, that is the cells eat up part of themselves, and by this process also eat up MTB. And again, this gives a better immune response. We didn't know everything in the beginning, I have to confess. So there is a certain degree of serendipity. Now, this is also very briefly where we are now. So as you know already, we are in a phase three trial. Before that, we had to show that our vaccine was efficient and safe in preclinical trials. That's more or less in experimental animals. We had to then produce it under GMP, good manufacturing practice, something that is needed if you want to go later into humans. You cannot just inject something into humans. This must be done under very careful um, um, overview. Then we showed safety toxicity is low and therefore it was approved formally. We had to remove a resistance marker, has been done, and then we licensed it to the vaccine project management, vaccine project management, and that's when it started to become VPM. So it's just a new name. And then I would say we were lucky that it was sub-licensed to the largest vaccine producer in the world. That's not GlaxoSmithKline. They make the most money out of vaccines, but it is Serum Institute India, which is the normal supplier, the normal supplier of most vaccines that are given to Gavi. Gavi is the global alliance for vaccines and immunization. I was once part on their board, so I know them very well. The global alliance wants to bring out vaccines to poor countries. They get supported by many countries, United States, Germany, many others, and also by the Gates Foundation. And importantly, they want to have those vaccines at very low price. And because they buy so many large lots of vaccines, they can really negotiate and reduce prices dramatically. So we're talking about vaccine prices in the cents or dollar, not in the hundred dollars or so area. This is a topic which we could discuss in length, but it's an important point. So normally Serum Institute gets these bets because they are low cost and um, they um, uh, took over our vaccine. As I mentioned before, we are in phase three, so we had to go phase one. In Germany, our vaccine was safe and immunogenic in adults, adolescents in Germany. It went then into Sub-Saharan Africa now, after we had shown that it works in a country where they, or in an area where it was developed. We went into a high endemic area, Sub-Saharan Africa, in this case, South Africa. There it was shown to be safe and immunogenic. Next step was then to go immediately into neonates. That's unusual. I told you before to go so early into neonates, but in vaccines, that's the way. It was safe and immunogenic in neonates in South Africa. And the next step then went into a phase two trial. It was shown also, it was then also tested in a phase two trial in HIV exposed and unexposed babies. I should tell you here that HIV 
uh, co effect, uh, HIV exposure means that the mother has HIV, the neonate not necessarily has HIV, and there are good measures nowadays in uh, industrialized countries to avoid HIV infection of the neonate. In South Africa, where the money issue is a different one, you often um, um, still have the risk of HIV transmission from mother to child. Most importantly, the South African government does not endorse BCG vaccination in HIV exposed neonates. So here, because our vaccine looked safer, we had a gap here and we said, let's test whether it is safer. So this is a study that I cannot talk about more because it's not yet fully unblinded. I wrote here unblinding 2019, but as real life often works, it takes a little bit longer. And it also works as a bladder cancer drug, but I'm not going into that. So let me now show you the three phase three trials. This is the first trial. This is what I just explained. Babies, neonates in sub-Saharan Africa that are either HIV exposed or unexposed, the study will uh, start soon in reality, namely this year. Um, the kickoff meeting has already taken place. Results are expected by 2024. Sorry, you don't see that here. It's 24. And this would mean let's replace BCG because it is safer and or more protective or more efficacious. Safety would already be an important point. The next trial has already started this year, and I don't have scientific uh, um, papers on this, but I have a newspaper, and actually these are more read than all of our scientific papers probably together by the people. What it shows here, that what it says here, that the Indian Council of Medical Research has started or is intending to start a trial on TB in adults, and these are the data. The Indian Council of Medical Research has proclaimed to eradicate TB from India very, very soon. That's very ambitious, but it also was a um, stimulus to bring more money into clinical trials. And our vaccine was selected by them, not the least because it is now being produced by the Serum Institute of India that is in the country where the, um, uh, where the government wanted to see some results. This is a large study with our own vaccine, another vaccine, a killed mycobacterial vaccine, and it comprises about 12,000 individuals in the whole trial. And we will see whether here, either as a pre or as a post exposure vaccine, we get an effect in household contacts, adults and adolescents. And again, results expected 2024. I have to confess here, and that is, you are probably aware, these are quite optimistic uh, timelines. Probably it will take longer, but I can at least, um, and I state that here. Yeah, that's how it is. And the last trial is already almost completed. It was announced in 2017, and that is a phase three trial for prevention of recurrence. Our major goal is not to prevent disease in people who had disease already, but it is clearly a clinical endpoint for a very compact clinical trial because 10% of those who had, be, had been cured of TB, 10% of those within 12 months developed TB again. Now that one can discuss a lot why this is the case. Some are reinfections because they live in a highly endemic area. And second, recurrence because the mycobacteria were not 100% eradicated. So this had started, started already, uh, this had started already, um, careful, yeah, uh, some time ago. Uh, expected completion is almost done. So um, this is a small study with about 1,000 people per group, 2,000 total, and therefore I hope that these results will show up, and then you can translate the data into a larger clinical so what I want to summarize here once more, so a prime, the PRIME study supported by the European government and by the Indian uh, company is the study in neonates, which has, will start very soon in reality, but all the paperwork has been completed. This is seven sites in Africa, believe me, a lot of paperwork takes place. The household contact study is um, supported by the Indian government through the Indian Council of Medical Research. And our study, the other study on recurrence is ongoing and almost complete. I will show you briefly some names 
And then we have to decide whether I should go on a little bit on cost efficiency and cost data or to start the discussion. I will not go into much of the data. These are the people who were over the last five years involved in either the biomarkers or in the vaccine, in vitro labs, in the lab more. This is the uh, Grand Challenge SIPs. I mentioned several times that our biomarkers had been supported by the Gates Foundation. I had the honor, but also the burden to get this all uh, completed. It is now completed. We have evidence for prognostic markers, seven sites in Africa, a lot. And this is the major players in the vaccine trial, vaccine project management, I mentioned them. Stellenbosch University is a major player in the whole game in South Africa and then also the Serum Institute of India. And of course, I thank all the trial participants. And this is all my funding, um, um, uh, which uh, led over the 15, last 15 years to what I showed and some other things, but I'm not going into detail. You want to start discussion now or give me another five to 10 minutes for some more data, uh, for some more points? What do you prefer? I can, sorry? I go a little bit in cost or should I stop here? Okay, so let me then go a little bit back into political arena and let's start here. So what the WHO and then later the United Nations had claimed, the original proposal was get rid of TB by 2050. And that means by definition, eliminate TB one in a million cases or less. That is extremely ambitious. I am not such a pessimistic person, but I would say that's unlikely. But still, so then it was also revised by the World Health Assembly, and that is more or less the goals now that the United Nations would claim somewhere around 90% reduction in TB death till 2030. Some talk about 2035, 90% reduction in new TB cases. So that's morbidity, that's mortality, and it's still extremely ambitious. And it costs a lot of money. So let us look at the money, what we have available globally, not me personally or you, that's the money that is around currently. It's about 700 million US dollars for TB research. That's a lot, you could argue, but you could also argue that's peanuts compared to cancer research and so on. And we're talking here about a major killer. So what we say is this is not enough. And most people talk about, it's not just from the blue sky, but after meetings, we need at least 2 billion US dollars or euros, whatever, for getting research and development done. Only talking about research and development. That's a lot of money, you could argue. We have a gap of 1.3 billion, we want more. And that's also the United Nations, I'll come back to that, wants us to give. I talk here, past for Toto, I mean me and you, all those who do research in drugs, in therapeutics and in vaccines. But is it too much? Now let's look at what TB costs us today. It is at least 2 billion Euro, US dollars, that is what we want more or less, 2 billion dollars just to treat the cases. That's chemotherapy more or less, that's just the drugs, that's pharma and the vaccine. The total cost then, if you look that some people have to be stay in hospitals and so on, comes to 20 million. But if you look at the whole thing, loss of school, loss of work, you come to at least 100 billion. So 100 billion, and most people that ec ec economists who talk about this, talk about of 0.5% loss of gross domestic product globally, which means I would say this is a bargain. The worst, yeah. Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, these costs are all done by groups, not by me. These are uh, uh, data that come from WH groups, they come from the EC, and I show you one slide here. This is, for example, the all, all parliament group, that is all parliament group, and all um, um, uh, parties in the UK in 2015. That's, for example, one example. There's a very interesting report also on AMR that came out by the British government two years ago, and that you should read. AMR is the total antimicrobial resistance, which tells you um, I think a little bit overdone, but um, having said that, these are always vague data for someone who works in the wet lab and is a natural scientist. These are economics data, and um, so that's not, it's soft data, but still, we are talking about 
We are not talking about 1.1 or so, we talk about 1 million or 1.5 and so on. So this is, and you look at this here, this is the UK, what they claim, estimated death by 2050, 75 million, cost 16 or something trillion, and uh, 0.63 until 2050. So this is just some, get, to get you some feeling. I would not bet this is 100% true. This is what uh, is around. It, take it more as a quali semi-qualitative, not fully quantitative. This is something that costs us a lot, and therefore every investment could have a kind of return of investment. So I think it sounds like a bargain, and I fully agree with Mary Lesker. I don't know whether you know the Lesker Prize. If you think research is expensive, try disease, and we all agree disease treatment is always more expensive than prevention. And uh, I, I, I try, my whole life is more or less thinking of prevention rather than action uh, or getting rid of the things that happened afterwards. So can, how can this be accomplished? And I will start very briefly, more or less, with medical intervention measures. Here we have the public and here we have the private. I would argue, and we can discuss that again, you can win a battle as an academic alone, you can win a battle as an industry partner alone, but if you will always lose the war until you decide to do it together. So I really argue that we really need um, to go together and we need all stakeholders. Let me just come back to the high level meeting, but I will be very brief. That's exactly, don't read it. It's exactly what they claim. Also, we have to work together. We have to be innovative. We need academia and we then bring it to an end and therefore we need industry. So let's do it, but how? Well, that's always difficult. It's tough to make decisions, uh, um, uh, especially about the future. Uh, this was Yogi Berra. I don't know whether he's still known in the US community. Um, um, coach of the um, Yankees, New York Yankees, but it was equally said already before him, to make that clear, I think most of his sentences had been said before. Anyway, the person I adore much more, I have to confess, is Niels Bohr, a Nobel laureate who already said prediction is very difficult, especially about the future, uh, and that means of more or less how can we get the high-hanging fruits. First, we need low-hanging fruits, not to be misunderstood, we need science, basic science on low hanging fruit, but we also need high hanging fruits. And that I would think is how to reach the high hanging fruit is something we have to look at. And that is my kind of message. We need more funding to get favorable environment for breakthroughs in science. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. And how much time do we have left? Not much. When do we have to get out of the room? Okay, so not a whole lot of time. I just wanted one follow up real quickly before I open it up, because I know there's a lot of questions here about the economics. And that's really, really a critical um, component of this. World Bank is really getting into the, these economic predictions and so forth. But I can just share with you with my own personal experience in you know, working at, in the government interagency White House level is that you can talk all day long about mortali mortality and morbidity. When you start talk talking about the economic implications, you get attention, you start getting attention. And so these modeling and, and economic predictions and not just direct cost of, of the research and development, but you gotta factor everything else into it. And, it, and it, it's, it's absolutely critical. And um, it's a shame though that it, it, um, we cannot you know, elevate these, these issues higher than they are but it kind of takes where we got to keep beating the drum um, hard uh, to keep elevate, elevating and advocate from a public policy uh, perspective. So with that, I do, do, you know, this is an amazing enterprise that you have developed and many, many, many partners. Um, and it's huge um, you, from, you know, from it, it, cause you still have the basic research enterprise and discovery in this, but a huge kind of manufacturing enterprise and clinical trial enterprise. I, how would you describe your specific role today in, in, in this big, huge enterprise that's global in reach in clinical trials and, and, and scale, commercial scale-up manufacturing? I mean, you're the brains behind it, but what, how, how do you describe your role as, as, as the, really the leading scientist that now has had to um, engage and promote this huge enterprise? 
that, that includes, you know, the India pharmaceutical yep. manufacturing. Well, I think the, the lessons I had to learn the hard way, and I give you the message, is collaborate, 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 get together, and just believe that you can only be the best in one aspect or two aspects, but you can't be the best in everything. So I think that's the major point. Get the stakeholders together. I've been involved in WHO in SAGE 30 years ago already, uh, which is the kind of advisory committee on vaccines. I think you have to see it. And the second, uh, the second very, so try to find your partners and that is actually what, if I would have shown all the slides, I more or less won't get the stakeholders together. And I have to say I was in certain situations, I was lucky or unlucky, take it as you want. For me, it was lucky or serendipity. My institute was established at the center of Berlin, in the center of Berlin. So I, and I got used to talk to politicians. So I could, whenever an infectious disease out, well, that's perhaps too much, but often I was then called by politicians, take them serious, you need them ultimately. So take the broader picture and, um, um, and, and that's more or less what I can say. I did not want to claim that I lead these clinical trials. Be modest, you can't do everything. And if you do one thing too much, then you lose anyway. Because so I think that um, I really respected um, the activities of others who do their work better than me in their field and so on. So, but it's a, that's a major point. For you. Very good, so I wanna open it up to questions. Before there's a question, I also wanna remind everybody that we're very, very fortunate um, to have Stefan here, actually on faculty as a Hagler, a senior Hagler fellow here at Texas A&M, and, and he'll be with us in that role for uh, till March this uh, year. Through, uh, through, through when? Till mid year March. Okay, a total of all together, yeah, but this year. time till mid March. So we're really, really yep. fortunate to, to have him essentially on our faculty uh, through this mechanism. So questions, please. Two questions. <laughs> Yes. So uh, my question is, um, uh, when you develop a vaccine and then you go through all these trials, it takes uh, a decade. Yes. And in this decade, you might come up with a modified part of the vaccine yeah. that is more efficacious, more yeah. safe, but your trial is on yeah. old version. So what will happen and how you will move? Can you yes. reduce that? I mean, if you decide I will go with the advanced version, then can you go with the advanced trial, not from the basic or what will happen with those? This is an important question and it's also a difficult question, particularly for people like me who are impatient. We have actually published that we have further improved our vaccine in in vitro and in mouse or experimental animal models. You have to accept that, as I said before, they take the lead once they do certain things and it is more or less their lead. And it's clear that often once you are in a clinical trial pipeline, you have to go on and not start from scratch. You may come back later. Uh, you, you, the, 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 well, if you, are, if you want to spend more money, yes, you can have 10 trials, but these, um, these uh, things are cost expensive. I mean, we're talking about a hundred million for a clinical phase three trial at least. So you have to accept that you go on with what you had already and then come back later if there is need or not. It took a hundred years before we took up, or 90 years before we took up to improve BCG. It was developed in 1919 or 17, to 21 in the last stages, and we took it up later, um, which also shows you, you sit on the shoulders of giants, but you can't change the boat easily. That's just, you have to accept. This is not like me in the lab starting another thing in one stays some evidence. Thank well, you. I think we're, we're out of time. I hear the, the uh, students. Uh, oh gosh, yeah. Class, but, uh, I wanna, uh, thank you very much for Actually, for your dedication, your commitment to uh, trying to solve this, this huge global challenge. So, thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for attending. And, uh, yes, and if there are questions, let me know.